reading along your Bible and come across a verse and wonder why it made the cut? Like, why was this important? Because as you read it, maybe it's confusing or, or maybe it seems kind of obscure. Well, I want to look at a couple of verses this morning that would probably fall into the obscure category if you're just reading across them for the first time. And yet, I think they're important for two reasons. First of all, they fit really well with our series, A Walk in the Woods, because they talk about trees and birds. But secondly, I think they fit really well with a couple of issues that are going on in our world right now, and some issues that I think we need to consider. And so let me encourage you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 22. And as you turn there, let me share a little bit about the book of Deuteronomy. It means the second giving of the law. And that's exactly what it was. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt the first time, they came to Sinai. Moses gave them the Ten Commandments and they got ready to go into the Promised Land, sent some spies ahead. But those spies came back with a discouraging report and the children of Israel panicked. And as a result, they never got to go into that Promised Land. They just wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Well, now, 40 years later, their children are encouraged to go and take that land, the promised land. And Moses says, let's go, but let me remind you of those laws that I gave the first time. And so the t Ten Commandments are given a second time here. And then Moses goes through this book and, and it's actually a guide, but he, he gives instructions that he wants the people to follow when they go into the promised land. And by the time we get to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse number six, it starts to feel like just a, a bit of a random list as God's just checking off one thing after the next. And he says this, and, and please read along with me. If you come across a bird's nest beside the road, either in a tree or on the ground, and the mother is sitting on the young or on the eggs, do not take the mother with the young. You may take the young, but be sure to let the mother go so that it may go well with you and so that you may have a long life. Just to put that into my words, so if you're walking through the woods and you see a tree, and in the tree you see a bird's nest, and in that bird's nest, you see a bird and either some eggs or some little birds. You can take the eggs or the birds, and we're assuming for food, but let the mother go. And if you do that, life will go well for you. Now, as I read that verse, I'm like, what's that all about? I mean, I've, I've run into some bird's nests. I've actually seen some eggs and maybe some little chicks, but I, I, I've never messed with them at all. I, I've just let them go. It just seemed like the right thing to do. And I might not pay a whole lot of attention to that verse, except for that last line. And that last line is almost like God saying, hey, look at this more closely. He says, take care of these birds so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life. So that means there must be something going on in this verse that's maybe a little bit more than what meets the eyes. And I think that's the case. Now, when God gives us a command, he never does it to be arbitrary or, or to be annoying or just because he feels like you know, this would be something good to try. He gives it to us either to reveal something about himself or he gives it to us because he knows that it will make our lives better. And I think in this case, it's both. We find out something a little bit about God, but we also find out a lot about how we can make our lives better. So why did God give us this command? Well, there's a principle behind it. And that's what I wanna to get to today. But to get to that principle, I wanna take you down two different paths. And they're very different. But the paths are the two different interpretations that scholars have of this verse. And I think both of them are very valid possibilities. And when you hear them, they're gonna seem extremely diverse. But if you think about it, they really do lead us to a place at the end where they come together. And so let's consider the first of those possible interpretations. It's this, to promote harmony with nature. It's interesting to me in this verse how we have the convergence of all of nature. First of all, we assume that we're talking about land because we have trees and birds and they have to be somewhere. Well, the book of Deuteronomy is about land. In fact, 190 times the word land is used in the book of Deuteronomy because that's where they're going, to this new land. And so we have land, we have trees, we have birds, and then a person comes along too. 
And so we have these four elements of nature all converging, the land, plant life, animal life, human life. And it's just an interesting picture of how all of them are completely interconnected and related. Think about this. The land provides a place for the tree to grow and it provides nutrients for the tree. At the same time, the tree filters some of the contaminants out of the soil. The tree also protects against erosion of the land. The birds come and they find protection of the tree and they eat the berries of the tree, but then they go off and they scatter those berries and the seeds and other trees grow. The birds also eat the insects that would damage and destroy the trees. Man comes along, he can plant a tree. He can cultivate the tree. He can pick the fruit of the tree and eat from the tree. He can even use the tree for lumber and build shelter for himself. But man needs to take care of that tree as well. And we see nature all come together. And we could talk about the word nature, or we could talk about the word environment, or we could talk about another word that I want to use here in just a minute. Now, sometimes though, when we use that word environment, it makes us a little nervous because that word has been politicized. And we see where environment has actually been edified to the place where it's almost worshiped and where nature is put on the top step and man is somewhere beneath it. Well, that's obviously not correct, but it's no more correct for us to reverse that either and to say that man is on the top and he can do whatever he wants to to nature. That would not be right either. In fact, we can look at Genesis and get the true idea of how it's supposed to look. Genesis 1.28, God says to Adam and Eve, you need to fill the earth and subdue it. You need to have dominion over it. And some people look at that and say, well, we're supposed to subdue it. We're supposed to push it down. We're supposed to have dominion. But dominion and domination are not the same thing. The idea of subduing the earth is not to exploit it, not to be its master, but to master it and to utilize it and to extract from it all the good that God put in it in the first place. In Genesis chapter 2, verse number 15, it tells us that God put man in the garden to take care of it, to cultivate it, to help it. And I think we need to be reminded of that sometimes, that we have a responsibility to nature and to the environment that we live in, that we need to do what we can do to protect it, that we not be wasteful with it, that we follow good practices and procedures that will help restore it and renew it. Nature was made to be renewable. Think about it. We live in seasons and we go through winter, but then we come back to spring and summer, fall, winter, because it's, nature is constantly renewing. The water cycle does the same thing. It's constantly renewing. And even this passage here in Deuteronomy 22 talks about this constant renewal. Why don't we take the mother bird here? Because she'll be a continued source of food. And if you kill her, you've terminated that source. And so it's a good reminder in this verse to do what I would call, or what I would say is this third word. And it's to practice earth stewardship. Earth stewardship. The earth that we've been given, the environment that we live in, nature all around us, plants, trees, flowers, birds, animals, wildlife, all of that was a gift that was given to man. And we need to be careful with that gift. Why? Because the way that we treat the gift tells us tells what we think of the gift. And the way that we treat the gift also tells what we think of the gift giver. Now, I've personally been challenged this in this way but by my own daughter who, who went off to Africa for a semester to study abroad. And when she came back, she started talking about things like, we don't need to use as much water as we do. And, and we, can, we can do composting and, and we can use renewable and reusable bags, things like that. And it came from her living in a culture where it was necessary because they don't have the resources that we do or the access to resources that we do. It was necessary for them to make the most out of them. And in the process, 
they ended up treating creation a whole lot better than what I think we do. And so I want to challenge us this morning with this area that a lot of times we're like, no, 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 you know, that's just for politics. No, it's for Christians. It's for Christ followers to think about our responsibility to the world that God has put us in. And we need to be reminded to be good stewards of everything that God's given us. Now, that's one path that you can take when you read this verse, when it talks about the birds and the eggs. But there's a completely different path that goes in an incredibly different direction that's a possibility as well. And it's this. We need to promote humaneness in people. Hum humane means to be kind, to be gentle, be to be thoughtful, uh, to be compassionate. And this verse was a reminder to God's people to be that way. When you come upon a bird that can't defend itself from you, still treat it with respect, still let it go free, still spare its life. And we need to be reminded to live that way as well. We live in a world that's lost a lot of humaneness. We see a lot of name calling, we see a lot of anger, we, we see a lot of, of chest thumping, uh, we see a lot of finger pointing, we, we see a lot of treatment of people that's not humane. And, and, and we need to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. On a very simple level, this is played out, if any of you follow along on the, the Nextdoor app, there's been a bit of a controversy in the neighborhood where I live uh, because there have been jet skiers on Woodhull Lake who have been deliberately hitting swans with their jet skis. And people are outraged, and well, they should be, because God puts inside us this ability to feel with and to feel for even a helpless animal like a swan. And we could be reminded from this verse that in life, we need to look out for the helpless. But it's not just animals, it's people. The coronavirus has given us a great opportunity to do that as well. We hear numbers like 100,000 people have passed away because of this. And if we don't know anybody and if we're not connected to anybody, it just is a number. But each one of those numbers represents a life. How does that hit you? And each one of those lives was connected to another life or to multiple lives. How does that hit you? People who are experiencing great loss, that should evoke feelings of sympathy and empathy in us. We could take a, another example that's really big in the news right now and should be. And it's this whole idea of racism. And we're once again confronted with this idea that people could be treated differently because of their color. And we have seen where people have been treated inhumanely and it's even cost them their lives. And we should be outraged, especially as Christ followers. It's not right. And we need to do what we can to say, hey, this is not what God wants. You can go back and look at this obscure verse in Deuteronomy and figure that out. Now, earlier this week, I sent out the, the email waking up that we've been sending out and included an article there and just a little bit of a response to the current issues going on and what we should be doing about it. And I just like to remind us of, of five things that I suggested there and to say, hey, these are ways that we can practice humaneness. First of all, we can have the conversations and sometimes they're tough conversations, but they're conversations that we need to have because we need to keep it in our minds. Secondly, we need to learn. And if you are not a black person and I'm not a person of color, we don't really know what it's like to walk in their shoes. And I don't think we can know what it's like to walk in their shoes. So we need to read, we need to watch, we need to listen so that we can actually be informed and get as close as we can to where they live. Thirdly, we need to connect. We need to build bridges with people of color. And all of us know people like that. And maybe we think in our minds, well, I don't treat them any differently, and that's probably true. But they are resources to us so that we can become better informed and so that we can do something 
about this situation. Fourthly, we need to speak up. God gives us a voice so that we can be concerned about the people around us who are more, more vulnerable. Let's take our opportunities to do that. And finally, we can pray. We can pray for the families of those who, uh, victims who lost their lives. We can pray for the communities who, who feel the pain once again. We can pray for wisdom to know how to deal with this. We can pray that some of the systemic problems here in our country would finally be fixed. And so that everybody can live, live on equal footing. And that would be my challenge to you. But it all comes from this verse. How much of your life is characterized by humaneness, kindness, gentleness, and compassion? You know, it's interesting to me that God puts this verse in the Bible because at first glance, it tells us to take care of the birds. And we should because they're part of the environment that God gives us. But then we're also told to take care of the people who live in this environment. And when we understand both sides or both paths of this issue, it brings us to a convergence at the end, and that's life. Both paths are about life. We treat the birds right because those birds help sustain life. We treat people right because people are life. And actually, we need people to sustain us as well. And so this verse, the big idea, the big theme is life. And so let me challenge you in your life. When you come to a tree on your walk in the woods and you see a bird's nest, well, be reminded that our environment is important and we need to do all that we can to protect it, to sustain it, and even to, to help it as we move forward into the future. But when you come to that bird's nest, be reminded of this as well, that there are people who are vulnerable, that there are people that need people to speak up to them or for them, and we need to be the ones making a difference in their story as well. And so when we come to that bird's nest, it reminds us of our responsibility to both the earth that we live on, but also to the people who live on that earth. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this little obscure verse. This little idea that you put in there that was such a great reminder to your people to be about the environment where they live, whether that's nature or whether that's people. So many times we can become so occupied with our own world in our own needs and our own desires that we're careless and we're wasteful and we're flippant and we're calloused. Don't let us be those people. But challenge us, I pray, through your Holy Spirit to be people that care, that care about the world that we live in, but that most of all, care about the people live in our world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to say thanks again for joining me. And always a privilege to have you along. Next Sunday is going to be a little bit different. We're hoping to meet in person at the church, Waterford Community Church, and invite you all to join us. If for any reason you don't feel comfortable with that, we will still be offering an online option. It'll be a little bit different though because we'll be streaming and it'll be available at 11 o'clock so you won't be able to tune in until then. But we'll keep you posted on what that's gonna look like. We're also gonna be sending out an email this week that will be requesting an RSVP from you on whether or not you plan to attend. That will just help us, if you don't mind, help us uh, to make plans for what Sunday should look like. So I hope to see you next Sunday either at church or online. God bless you.